Amy Ferris, coordinator of the Brookdale Visiting Artist Program. I'm here today in the Center for Visual Arts Gallery with visiting artist Kimberly Trowbridge. Kimberly, thanks for coming today. We're Thank so you happy so to have much you. for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You've come all the way from Seattle to us via Brooklyn, so it's quite a long trip. Um, I'd like to frame our discussion today around um, five words that I pulled from your artist statement that's on your website. Okay. I'm going to read them off to you right now. Okay. They are, I had to write them down, they are narrative, theater, language, history, and recreate. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to start with history and narrative because okay. the sense I think that's very immediate when you look at the scope of your work is a um, very personal and intimate relationship with art history, mm -hmm. but also with a personal narrative and a personal mm -hmm. history. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about um, how art history has related to your work yeah. and in terms of a personal narrative you're creating? Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're exactly right that I feel like a lot of my work is the weaving of my own story into the story of history's painting and the story of what it means to make images and specifically make images of figures. And so my first love in painting was the Italian Renaissance. Yeah. So how they're setting up a theater or a stage of characters and enacting an event. And so that's something that I've related to a lot and thinking about my own life, starting with self-portraiture and kind of placing myself into my own theater um, in order to create my own history, in order to create my own story, but I think ultimately to find a new narrative for myself, that the act of making an image or creating an image is an opportunity for me to rethink my narrative and have a certain creative control over how my story is going to unfold. That is one of the most interesting, interesting things about your work to me is that a sense that you are not um, burdened by art history. You are a figurative painter. Mm -hmm. um, I think for many figurative painters, it is a struggle to find a place, especially mm -hmm. after, say, Duchamp, in the, the canon of art history. But you, for you, it seems to have been a springing off point, which is really very, very positive. It feels positive to me. Um, I guess there is a certain amount of grappling or struggling in it, um, but it's that grappling and that struggle that I find really rich. In particular, I think as a woman who, you know, the story of women um, autobiographically through painting and creating stories doesn't exist. Right. And so there's something really liberating about that, about using uh, the tools and vocabulary of painting's history um, in order to write my story. Like, I feel like it's a really valid contribution. Yeah, it seems very powerful to sort of take control of that. Yeah, it's fun too. Yeah. It's absolute blast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you know you still do work with the figure and landscape is very important to you yes. as well. In fact, you have one particular painting. It kind of makes a reference, I I think, to art history, but also brings in the figure and landscape. And that's a painting that you call "I Am Nature," uh -huh. which seems to be a reference, I think, to probably the Pollock it um, is. quote. It is okay. So, but yes. you've got a figure in there and you've got nature in there as well. Um, so it was a direct. Um, that the relationship to so that was his quote was you know uh, well so his painting of course the drip and it's abstract and it's saying well you know this is abstract expressionism why aren't you painting nature or how is nature involved or how is the self involved and he's saying well I am nature and so this is a painting mine called I am nature which is of a woman whose body is kind of being built by or uh, disassembled by nature and so yeah. A huge reoccurring theme in my work is the relationship of the figure to the landscape or the figure yes. to the outside space. Yes. And for me, that has a lot of personal and philosophical implications because it's the integration of how we define each other, how our environment defines us, right. um, how we're connected um, in kind of a, I guess that's kind of a hoodoo voodoo way, but <laughs> what's so beautiful about painting is that each of those shapes, whether it be figure or tree, that they're these physical things that you're putting on a surface, that they're right. parts, they feel like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like a language that you get to move around. Let's talk about language and let's talk about theater because that's sort of a nice intro mm -hmm. to my next question. Um, you once thought you were going to be a poet, I remember mm -hmm. you saying in different mm -hmm. interviews, and I wondered um, how much this perhaps drive to create something in a visual language carries over into your painting. When you begin a painting or when you work on a painting, do you approach the painting as an idea of language? Because you're, you seem to have formed a very personal 
almost structured language with your paint. Your paint surfaces are so wonderful and they take into account the very specific kinds of language you can perhaps give through, through paint, mm -hmm. which can be enormous, but still, your paintings feel very personal in the way they communicate visual language. Do you feel that this sort of other side of you that perhaps is probably still a poet, okay, mm -hmm. but maybe speaking in a different mm -hmm. language. How much of that does that relate to your paintings? How much of you are uh, are you conscious of that as you work? I'm pretty conscious of it in that. So when I start a painting, I don't know what it's going to be, and so mm -hmm. the whole process or journey of making a painting feels like the writing of a story or yeah. the the building of a poem. And so how I place one image next to another feels like. Uh, images that you would stack up like a poem and so how they interact with each other doesn't exist until that particular stacking on the surface of the canvas happens and so okay. I always want to be surprised by the thing that is in front of me. Um, I think that you know my process continues to evolve and a big part of being an image maker um, for me has been finding ways that I can make images that allow more of my talents to come in or more ways of thinking about myself or defining myself. And so while for a long time poet was kind of the larger umbrella that painting was underneath, now it's dancer. And so <laughs> I'm really aware of the theatrics of painting, of the idea of composing an image with the body. Mm -hmm. And so that's allowing a lot of different parts of myself to start to flood into this image of the image maker, which is so exciting for me. Do you think theater is the natural meeting place of if, uh, the visual and the maybe poetic language? I think so. For me right now, it certainly feels exciting. Um, and you know that I've started to bring in video into that. Yes. And video feels like a way of just sketching or drawing for me. And it's yeah. all just on my iPhone. You know, it's not technical at all. It's just a really direct way to access content. I find your videos um, pretty fascinating. And I'd like to focus on one in particular, if that's OK with you. Sure. I have some questions about that. It's a video that's called Love in the Time of Whatever. Mm. I think it's fairly recent. I believe it's from 2014. Is that correct? Mm, yes, that seems right. Around that range, 13, 13 yeah, or 14. year or so. OK, yes. and again, uh, viewers can view this uh, video on yes. your website. Yes. Um, and it is based on a poem by Mark, um, is it Leidner? Am I pronouncing it right? Mark Leidner. Leidner, yes. excuse me. And the name of his poem is Love in the Time of Whatever Disease This Is, yes. which of course seems to be a reference to the love in the time, time of, of cholera. cholera. Yeah, yeah. Cholera. Okay, so there's a, the whole la like sort of liter uh, layers of literature here. Mm -hmm. And the, the fascinating thing about this video is that, first of all, it, see, it, feel, it does feel very theatrical. It's just, it's, you, we don't see you. It's your hands placing mm -hmm. these very quick moments, still lives, um, triggers for it, uh, images that seem to be triggers for other things. Mm -hmm. And it's very beautiful. Thank you. It, Here's what I want to ask you about. That was, it, you have two takes in this video. The first take is this presentation of mm -hmm. the imagery. And then you have take two. We're interleaved with the imagery. It's almost like what I was reminded of is being backstage while production is going on off sta you know, on stage that you can't mm -hmm. see because you're putting the camera around all the objects that you used mm -hmm. in the video. Can you tell me what that's about? Yes, yeah, so that's interesting that you're bringing that up because that still carries over so much into the work I'm dealing with right now, which is where are we viewing things from? What's the perspective in which we're seeing things? And so I'm super excited, like yeah. placing my paintings in different contexts for interesting, uh, for different viewing points. But so that was the very first video that I had ever made. And wow. I was asked <laughs> to be part of this group show at a wonderful little gallery in Seattle called Vignettes. And we were all asked to respond to one of Mark Leidner's poems okay. um, in any way we wanted. We could take a stanza, we could take just a specific image, we could do anything we wanted with it. And many of his poems are really long and kind of just these beautiful kind of narratives that don't exactly work out, but incredible images. And I found that I was unable to just pluck an image out of the middle of a poem and deal with it, I really found that for me, I needed somehow to be able to take on the entire epic. And so I thought I was going like to be a epic. drawing or a painting, <laughs> but it turned out that there was no way I couldn't, couldn't face or translate the sense of time, yeah. of moving from one image to another. And so 
I set up my laptop, and you know they have the little photo booth on yes. the laptop screen, and just use my computer, set up a little theater, and I made all the props yeah, for every amazing. single yeah. image that happens in that poem. And so it was still a very hands-on creative act for me, which is important to me as a painter, um, but I got to use and kind of play house with all of these images. Um, and then the second take that I did yeah. was me taking my iPhone and videoing an image of all of my props yes. that were on the table because I was so moved by the image of them sitting there. And then as I would roll over one of the props, I would insert a clip from that yes. first take of me using it. And so in some ways it was like a little thought bubble or like moving into one of the props and seeing it in action. And so it was just a different way of experiencing imagery. It, it was so interesting, and Thank I really you. felt that that particular technique enforced the feeling of the passage of time for me. Mm. I had just seen the performance, and is kind of what I thought of it was, mm -hmm. but it was imagery, but it was performance, it mm -hmm. was theater. And then the take two, there was this, it was amazing. It was like, it was happening again mm -hmm. in real time but from a different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was incredibly powerful. Thank you. It was amazing. I think the idea of time is one of the most interesting to me in terms of the relationship between video and painting. Because yeah. through video, we experience it unfolding in time, with painting it being the singular surface, and so there's a certain uh, instantaneous quality to it, and yet, all of the layers behind that to even get to that layer of reality that we're looking at it on. It's all stacked behind that, which the image maker has experienced intimately and that the viewer may or may not experience. Um, I happen to be a fan of paintings and images that give the viewer access to those other layers. That's why I think Cezanne has been one of the most important contributing voices in our history is he gave us, he left a lot of doors open so that we could come inside and see how the thing was built. I kind of think of the building of an image like a mountain and you're crawling up, but like I think it's really powerful to stop before you get to the climax and allow your viewer to do that instead. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise it feels like a shut door right. or that like some artists will like clean up after themselves. <laughs> you know, I'm not interested in that. I want like dust on the floor that I can crawl through. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess that's something also that's interesting to me about video is this, that it's unfolding in time to be able to show like in the video you're referencing, love in the time or whatever, the act of building a structure, the act of building an image, the physicality of the making of an image is really interesting to me. Have we lost the moment, though? You just mentioned the moment of stopping before the climax. Have we lost that moment with video? Are you still able, do you still feel able to, to take that pause before the end, as you said you feel you can do with painting? In it's a different ways, media, but. I feel but... like the whole setup of its language is the ability for the viewer to access the thing unfolding. Mm -hmm. Like, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> and that's so exciting for me. As a painter, yes, who's used to, to working yes. in another method. Yeah. The, one of the last paintings, it's, it's, or not, it's, a, it's an actually an installation that you um, did for um, the, the Netty exhibit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's a Netty Award. Um, and and it's, it's like you've immersed yourself fully in the landscape. I think it's called... Um, uh, remind me, it's outside looking mm -hmm. inside. Help outside the garden, <laughs> garden looking, looking inside, inside the garden. garden. Yeah. So yeah. you have a video component. Mm -hmm. You have a painting. You've created this little space. Okay. And so this is the title suggests the position of the viewer. Yes, exactly. Okay. Outside, mm -hmm. but you have placed it. You have set the setup that they're inside, and the curtains are painted, and the stool mm -hmm. is painted, mm -hmm. and so. And you're bringing in everything new that you're working with. And so as a point of de departure, a point of departure for your perhaps recreation of what you're doing, what, yes, what's going on with that, that piece? that piece was really a big statement for me because it very clearly set up all those different places of departure, different places of me as the maker and as the viewer to view images. So set up an entire theater, you're right, with curtains surrounding the painting 
and with a video component uh, where I'm walking through a landscape that is similar to the one in the painting. Mm -hmm. um, there's furniture for people to sit on. And so I've just created this entire world. Um, and something that was fun about that piece too was the very final piece, which I wasn't aware of until the day of the exhibition was I spontaneously took a pillowcase and painted it with the same inks that I had painted the curtains with and cut it into a shirt and realized oh. that, you know, that whole stage that I had built, that the final moment was the protagonist stepping into the space that both spoke to the video and to the piece. And that was super exciting for me. It's, it's a beautiful piece. Thank you. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about your work with us, Kimberly. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Well, you're so welcome. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be back with the workshop that Kimberly conducted today for students. This is not your ordinary community college. This is an education for the 21st century, a college that learns from industry trends and adapts to the changing job market. This is a group of acclaimed professors and a staff who will stand at your side and help you kick down any door you choose. This is where you can learn a new skill or earn a degree, online or in person, at six locations across Monmouth County. This is not your ordinary community college. This is Brookdale. This is college redefined. This is success reimagined. So, my palette is set up in a very specific way that I hope that you all will follow. I have orange in the center up top. And I, I like to go ahead and put two blobs of orange out because I'm gonna be doing one mixing it with the green and one mixing it with the violet, okay? And that just ensures that they kind of stay away from each other, <laughs> okay? So this is a cadmium orange. This is a phthalo green, which looks pretty black out of the two, but if you see, if you're familiar with this color, you know that it is, it's a very intense color. <laughs> so careful with it, it likes to take over. So that's a phthalo green, and this is a dioxazine violet, which is a very cold purple, just to give you a sense of its hue. Very, very cold purple, okay? And so these are the secondaries that we are gonna start with. And so after I show you how to mix your palette, I'd like you to set it up in the same way. I also have two blobs of white. I like to have a white for my green and a white for my violet, okay? So what we're gonna start off by doing is doing two variations between each of these and also our green and our violet, okay? So knowing what I just told you about phthalo green, it being an incredibly strong pigment, we do not want this to be the body of this. So if I started with a big blob of that phthalo green and then started adding orange to it, I would almost never even get anywhere near to it not being green. <laughs> Thalo really loves its own identity, okay? So I'm gonna start by taking some orange here and some orange here, just dividing it. This pile, I'm gonna put just a fleck of green. You can always add more, but you can't add less. So just add a little bit. Exactly, <laughs> salt, exactly. How are you gonna get it out? So I'm just changing my orange to that kind of camping hiking color, that burnt orange, okay? So I'm just altering its hue a little bit. And then I'm gonna do the same, but I'm gonna go closer to green. So I'm gonna add a little bit more green to this guy. So look how very little I'm starting with here, you guys. Okay, so now the color I'm looking for here I want it to be obviously greener than that. And I actually want it to start announcing the hue green. So kind of an olivey green. Okay, so do you see how now I have an orangish tertiary and a greenish tertiary? All right. And so of course we can do infinite variations between them, okay? But I just want us to start with these two clear warm and cooler tertiaries, okay? And then we can always satellite off closer to the green if we need to while we're working. And so the next thing I want you to do with these two before moving on to that is taking a little bit of that here. Notice the size of my piles. Don't be skimpy. Like, also don't squeeze out a ton, but at least the size, because notice how I'm using that, and I want enough to use it to paint with. And then I'm gonna add 
some white so I can see it at a lighter value. So shoot for kind of a middle value, because as you're painting, if you find you need a lighter one than that, then you can do a version that has more light. So again, we're just gonna do two values and two tertiaries of each for starting. Okay, and then I'll do the same. Notice I'm wiping my palette before, my palette knife before each one. Okay, and if you hold your palette knife up to the other pile, you should be able to see very, very clearly that one is lighter, okay? Okay, and then I'm gonna do the very same thing over here with my orange violet. I'm gonna pull some of that there, some of that here. I'm gonna grab another paper towel. All right, so I'm gonna add also dioxazine violet is a very intense, strong color. So really the body of all these paints for the most part is orange. The body meaning it's the viscosity, it's, it's the kind of the clay, it's the material. And the phthalo green and the dioxazine violet are really just the tinters. They're just tinting that pile. Okay. Ah, oh, don't you just want to paint some trees? Yeah. And so then I'll do the same thing with this where I add white. All right. Then I'm going to do the very same thing with my green and my violet. Okay, I'm going to continue to mix my palette while you guys get yours started and you can always come up with your palette knife and kind of reference my color. Okay, and I'll be coming around and giving you each a hand while you're working. Okay, not good. Breathe. Take your time with it. So I really feel that Learning to mix the paint and spend time with noticing the differences is 80% of making a painting. So these you haven't done your lighter values of yet, but you didn't add any white into these, right? And you don't need to, because we can see them. They're beautiful middle values, right? But with these, you've got to add white to see it. Isolate that corner of it and now move over to the other corner of it. They're totally different colors, completely different colors. We don't have anything on our palette that really talks about red in the way that pink talks about red, right? We have all these beautiful pale warmths that are still very much talking about orange. So here's where satelliting comes in. Because these are just tinters or satelliters, you need hardly any of this paint. Ooh, sometimes that happens, oil rises. Let it out, let it out. So I'm just gonna put a touch of red there. And so I say, okay, well that pink sheet of paper at its lightest manifestation, of course, has a lot of warm light on it. And so I could go either way here, but I associate pink a little bit more with purple than I do with green. So I probably would choose this, but you could make that work because it's warm and it's light. But I'm going to take my warm light, I'm going to make it even lighter because that part of that pink paper to me is the protagonist when I look up there. And by the way, I didn't say this to you guys, but these are figures in a landscape, okay? This is grass, these are figures, this is a tree stump, this is a grassy, mossy knoll, this is a river. This is those studies of figures for me. Okay, this is the kind of thing I set up in my studio and work from, okay? So, I've got my warm light. I'm gonna add more white to it because it's my lightest light. And I'm gonna add a tiny touch of red to it, just to tweak it. I can start with my warm green, which is kind of this mud. And I still want to say green more closely than that. So in the same way I took my purple or took my red and satellited, I'm gonna make it greener, and it's still warmer green than that, but I'm gonna bump it with a little bit of yellow just to talk more closely about that saturated yellowy green color, okay? And it's very important that even though I added more of this and satellited in that, it's very important that it came originally from this. Because if I just 
left this out of the equation and just made a really yellowy green that might look exactly like that, that doesn't mean it's harmonious with these colors. We're creating a universe here, okay? And so by having some of that in it, even if it might not look as exciting, in fact, I even think that's a little too outside. I wanna uh, make it more, I wanna tertiary it up a little bit. Or yeah, or down, exactly, depending on your perspective. Yeah, so even that represents very beautifully, I think, what that yellow green is doing up there. It's different enough from everything else that it stands out. Okay? Good, this is a beautiful palette. Oh, I love your version of that. I envy it. It's a really, really nice color. start to be compromised. But what's nice is you have all these different colors of green, but they're all colder and darker. And so they still um, sit within the architecture of the painting as the cooler, darker section. It's very nice. These look fantastic. I'm super impressed. It's been really fun working with all of you. I'd love you guys all to get a look at what everyone else has done. You've all been so focused on your own. I think it'll be fun for you to see everyone else's pieces. These are wonderful. I really found that workshop helpful and I definitely found, uh, learned some really cool things today. The interaction of colors between each other, how colors play in light and dark, it all, it all matters in art and graphic design. It all, it's all very important and all interconnected for sure. Lighter, yes, it is. Unless you really have the opportunity to see things mixed before you and have the techniques explained to you, you know, I think that's the best way to learn. It is for me anyway. I think that the workshop is very helpful. I think that there's a lot of things that happen in art school that are just kind of brushed on or touched on, but uh, color theory is like a big thing that I think a lot of people should know, whether you're doing like traditional painting like we did today or any kind of mixed media and sculpture and just digital work and collage. I think that it's really forgotten about when it like goes over to the different kinds of like textiles and materials rather than in painting you can still like it's taught but it's once you get to school like I feel like everyone comes from different places that it's not as clear as it should be and I think this was a very good workshop to do that. Oh, <laughs> very nice. Oh she was very fun. <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was a long time since I actually took any classes and I enjoy classes here and enjoy this workshop very much so too.